All righty, all righty. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Valerie Leonard. I am the founder of Nonprofit Utopia Community for Emerging Nonprofit Leaders. And my goal is to train and develop the next generation of ethical nonprofit leaders. And we do that through consulting, we do it through community, <clears throat> as well as through coaching. Alrighty, and before we get started, I just want to do a little help. And the cancer, I think we're getting feedback. I think we have two instances of Crowdcast going. Alrighty, so we just want to do a little housekeeping. First of all, for those of you who are listening to Facebook Live, if you're going to join us in Crowdcast so that we can see your comments, you can. You can join us at Crowdcast.io. And hyphen dot CH. I really need to see a link if you're on Facebook Live. Alrighty. Um, okay, we've got feedback on your end. You have two instances open. You've got the phone as well as the computer. Is that correct? So we get that feedback whenever there are two instances of Crowdcast open. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so I think we're better. All right. All righty. So just a little uh, more in terms of the housekeeping. If you're here in Crowdcast, you'll notice that there are a few controls in front of the button on the bottom left. If there's a message with you, you can click onto that button while we're talking, and that will create a clip that you can share on Facebook or Twitter. Okay, and then Nonprofit Utopia, you can. And you can also ask a question. You can ask a question either in the chat room or you can ask a Difficulty. So I'm, I'm back with the video. Sorry about that, people. So our guests today are Natasha Dunn, and we have Kay Winding. Is Kay on the phone, or is, are you with us here? She's gonna be. Okay, she's gonna be. All right. So Kay will be joining us, and just so you know that um, Kay and Natasha, they are two of several co-founders of the Black Community Collaborative. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> We're here. The I'm wonders, here. The, the wonders of technology, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. We're all learning as we go along. And I thank you guys for being such wonderful, wonderful troopers, all right? So um, you're here just in time. So we've got 
Natasha Dunn, who is on the left side, right? I'm in the center. Yes. And then on the, you're on the right. Are you? I'm in the center of my phone. Oh, really? <laughs> Okay, so we all see different things. Natasha, mm -hmm. raise your hand. <laughs> We've got Natasha Dunn, and Natasha is a co-founder with K Winding. And That's me. <laughs> they're, several, they're two of several co-founders of the Black Community Collaborative, and they're also administrators of the Black Community Pandemic Prevention and Support Group on Facebook. So we're here today to talk about some of the lessons that they're learning along the way. And full disclosure, I have recently joined the group and I'm totally, totally impressed. So you will not get Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> this is here to share information and some of the lessons learned. But before we go there, um, Natasha, can you share with us, you know, a little bit of background? you know, for yourself and how you got to this point. So, yes, I am a very active parent, of course. I know mm -hmm. a lot of talk a lot about my darlings. Um, <laughs> yes. I would say they are my motivation. Um, and in particular, to ensure that our communities are safe for them, you know. Um, and so I've done a lot of community work prior to them um, being born, um, but I've escalated that. Um, I've been in a nonprofit and education field for over 15 years and um, have worked with community residents to help them elevate their voices and to ensure that we have equitable resources, um, parks, uh, schools. I've worked with parents across the city of Chicago. Um, to fight for quality education. Um, and I'm currently the manager of community engagement with Vosel. And Vosel is um, viewing our children as emerging leaders. Um, it's a mm -hmm. nonprofit organization. Oh, that with in the London, we're in the actually Austin area. Um, uh -huh. But our program is extended throughout the city of Chicago. We have 15 sites and partnerships with various schools, um, elementary schools. We provide it on the site early childhood education program um, once a week for families who have children zero to four. Um, and it's free and accessible and it's an amazing program. Um, and I also am the co-founder of the Black Community Collaborative. And our goal has been to really push the envelope to create a culturally relevant voice for our yes. community to ensure that we are not left out of uh, resources um, that our voices are at the table from a cultural perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, to also collaborate with other black facing groups in the city of Chicago so that we can elevate our voices. Okay, awesome, okay. awesome. And <laughs> Natasha and I met each other, oh my goodness. Years ago, yes. 2012. Oh. Yes, 2012. And I was going to say the last time I actually saw you on a show together. I forgot what show was that with Philip Jackson, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. we did a show together with him. So, yeah, it's been a while. And I've been you know, really fighting for education just since then. Really, 2011 and 10 was when I started my own independent journey to, mm -hmm. you know, to just really help parents understand their power. Um, mm -hmm. I had a situation with Chicago Public Schools early on when my babies were like in third grade. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I wanted to share that and also teach parents how to understand policy um, and how to use that as leverage for them to be able to advocate for their children within the system. Because sometimes we have to hold the mirror to the system and say, okay, well, this says this, then why aren't you doing this for our family? So, you know, that's what I'm also good at is holding the mirror <laughs> to our policymakers, to our um, political figures to say, this is what you're doing, but this is the need for our people. Can we create a, a avenue for us to all have what we are supposed to have? Right, right. Okay, and Katie, okay. tell us about yourself and what brings you here. Yeah. Well, my background is completely different from Natasha's. <laughs> um, I am born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I grew up in Auburn, Gresham. Um, okay. I have experienced a background in nursing. I started out in long-term care, and then I progressed to nursing administration, and then I went to uh, Stroger, where I worked in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, so... Yeah, so my background is heavily nursing. I also have a background in construction. 
Um, so I started doing community work through an organization called um, CCE, Citizens for Civic Education. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of their, how can I say, blogging or their posting. I ran the Facebook page <laughs> um, on the political side of things. Oh, okay. uh, and that's where Natasha and I met. And mm -hmm. then we linked up and we started doing things within the community issues that came up like the strike, the, you know, the past current strike. We did some political work. Um, I held an event for another group called ECCSC, uh, ex-felon community group. I threw the mural forum back in uh, February, um, what, last year, 2019. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now I am interested in getting our communities back, well, I don't want to say back in shape because I think we've been suffering for so long, but mm -hmm. I want our communities to start to thrive like other communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, I live in a very gun-torn neighborhood, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I'm in the 21st Ward. There mm -hmm. are a lot of shootings. I've seen a lot of young boys that I've knew since birth through kindergarten. I have a 26-year-old son. I left that piece out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, so, so many of his friends have died or people I grew up with and I'm just tired. I just feel like if, you know, if you grieve something, you have to get involved to make a change with those things that you grieve. So that's, you know, why I'm here. <laughs> I mean, hey, uh, you are really good at researching. She, she's oh, yeah. Fact checker. <laughs> we are now because that's the thing. It's like we want to leave with information that is valid exactly that is relevant so that people can make an accurate decision and understanding of where we are um and that's one of the basis of what we're doing too okay. yeah all right and before we get into the weeds of what you're doing can you tell us about the black community collaborative and you know who are some of their members and natasha that's a question for you mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so we, um, we founded um, Black Community Collaborative. Myself, Brian Mullins, um, Helen Tyler, um, uh, Rosita Shatanda, um, oh. uh, Willie Preston. Uh, I can name a few other people. Um, Kay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we and to me, I, I love them. Yeah, a nice dangerous group. I love them. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's that's what an alderman said when she saw us at City Hall. <laughs> Uh, Ursula, we have, we have nine, we, so we got together around the time of the teacher strike. Now, we mm -hmm. were very controversial in our stance um, against the strike. We mm -hmm. were coming from a cultural perspective, and that's what exactly. made us come together. It wasn't that we uh, we don't believe in the right for teachers to organize and strike. We do believe they should have that right, and we actually believe in unions too. Because that's unions, right, you come from a union background. Yeah. Our purpose for standing against it was that we wanted to be sure that well, we actually know that in the past, strikes have desecrated our community. Exactly. Um, has caused a reverse effect on teachers. Um, a lot of teachers have been fired. Um, our students, Black students, typically don't. Their schools aren't getting exactly what the North Side schools or the you know white or uh, upper wealthy schools get and so our goal was to shine a light on the, the education facts that's currently happening within our community and to have the union and cps really look at how can we make sure that if there's going to be a strike that black children and black teachers are going to it's beneficial from the from it. um and so that was what we did and so we all came together and we actually pushed cpu and cps to really end the strike. We oh, went to uh-huh, we went up to Malcolm X. We held a press conference in front of Malcolm X while they were going back and forth, holding our children out of school <laughs> um, to demand that they, you know, get it together, come to an agreement. Um, and and they did actually. Um, we spoke directly to the mayor's uh, education assistant. We spoke to uh, Stacey Gates and mm -hmm. Jessica Sharkey directly, and we told them our concerns of the Black community and how we wanted to be sure that our teachers and our children are going to have their fair share in this cut, because we realized, though, that the Hispanic community, the Latinx community, got a lot of benefits out of uh, their contract. We, yep. we weren't in for us at all. 
you know, yeah. and so that was our purpose and our goal. And we, we want to continue working on that realm to make sure that we are holding everyone accountable. Anybody that's public, that's a public service to our community or a political figure, this is the one we want to work with you. Um, mm-hmm. We want to also hold you accountable for the needs of our community. And that, that also goes to this with this COVID-19 situation. And that's why we um, put together this group because we know that usually okay. black people will get the short end of the All right. And Kay, can you tell us a little bit more about the group itself? The well, the point of the group, as Natasha has already stated, the point was to make sure that we are providing factual information um, to our communities. Unfortunately, there's a good and a bad side to social media. You know, <laughs> right. it, it's great for communicating abroad, city to city, state to state. But um, we are fully aware that there are a lot of misinformation that yeah. is spread across that platform. Um, you have people who, you know, they use Facebook as their sole voice and whatever's in their mind, they post it and it, it gets spread depending on their following ship. Um, you know, when this first happened, Natasha and I, we would talk every morning, we talk every day multiple mm-hmm. times a day <laughs> and during when it first kicked off we noticed that there was a sheer confusion there was some confusion right um amongst our people they weren't really understanding you know what is this what's happening what's true what's not because you know you had people that was adding to the equation you had people who was you know i've seen i've never seen so many people post about the medical field who have never read <laughs> or went to school, you know, for medicine. It's just, it's, it's crazy, right? And then here comes all of the propaganda. So the point of the group was to uh, bring uh, factual information, true information. Um, our focus though is mainly on the coronavirus as far as the resources, the causes, the effects, um, those um, infomercials on how to properly wash your hands, you know, how to mm-hmm. wear a mask, those important, those pertinent details. My um, stance on it was to kind of keep the politics out of it. Uh, we know that the election is coming and it can get kind of ugly, you know, because not in every- Chicago. <laughs> in Chicago, you know, because everyone they everyone do not honor the whole golden rule of political democracy. You know, we all have a right to choose and vote for whomever we choose. And unfortunately, that does not go over well with some. So I felt politics. It was very important not to bring politics in it because I didn't want us to lose sight on, you know, what is the true issue. The pandemic is our number one issue. Um, And that's what we need to focus on, because as you know, Natasha has brought up and as other people have brought up in the posting of the group, unfortunately, it has now looked upon that the African-American communities are the most effective. And we know why, because we have a lot of underlining Uh, comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. So we need people to be informed. And one more thing, and then I'll pass it back to you. One of the the greatest thing I think about the group, um, the last time I checked, there was like hundreds of members. But the good thing about the group, it is like a rainbow, right? Mm -hmm. There's not all African-Americans in that group. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, we have people from different walks of life. We have Uh, members of the Chicago Police Department there, members of the Chicago Fire Department there. We have nurses, we have doctors, we have respiratory therapists, we have community activists, we have people who are essential workers. Right, you know, that's out here. So there's a a broad, there's a spectrum of so many different people from different walks of life. And that's what makes it great because in that group, we are united and we're all grieving and we're all hurting and, you know, trying to understand where we are today. And it, you know, it's just, it's something that I pray that we can keep and, you know, for other things that come up, you know? Yeah. And we maintain that unity, but yeah, it's, it's an awesome group. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I was really, really, I I mean, I knew it was going to be good anyway, because I knew Natasha, right? Natasha knows that she's no nonsense. They they know she, you know, she knows the street lingo, but she can also advocate, you know, go toe to toe with the best of them in terms of policy. So I knew this Mm -hmm. was going to be a good group, right? 
But when I got there, I was so pleasantly surprised. You know, just like you said, it's a broad spectrum of people. And, and then when I looked at some of the content, like there's one lady who was, um, she was doing a survey so she could do a community needs assessment. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that I don't see, I, I guess, in other arenas where there's a community needs assessment that is focusing specifically on our issues. You know, we tend to get lost in the the diversity and, and God knows that I support diversity, but sometimes we get lost in it because our specific issues are not included in those surveys. But so, that was the, but that was the number one um, driving force when we created this group. We had our first uh, community meeting back in November, right before the holidays. Mm -hmm. And um, we had people from different wards. It was not just the 21st. There were people from, you know, across the city that came out and we talked and we shared a lot of information concerning the issues that grieves our communities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things that, you know, Natasha and I, Brian and others in the group, when we talked, what are we going after? And we always felt like we need to be different from other organizations. We don't want to talk to the organizations, but we want them to talk back to us. So when they're in, you know, when they're involved and they're interacting, they feel like they're solely a part of that. And that's we what we want the community base, the people in the community to feel involved. We don't want to talk at them. We want them to talk with us. You know, we're we're it's a give and take. And that was one of the the, the things that we you know, we created a group. That's something that we tried to center, you know, the creation of the group around, you know, the involvement of the community. OK, awesome. And Natasha, how are some of the parents using this group? It looks like your screen. Did it freeze up? Yeah, it looks that way. Uh, okay, well, Natasha. There she is, I think. Okay, you see her? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. I don't okay. think she heard the question. Okay, yeah, I didn't hear the question. Go ahead. Oh, okay, <laughs> so I'm just, my question to you is how are some of the parents using this group? So um, they're using it to get information, like up-to-date information about you know, how to protect their family. Um, we also have had just education um, facts and um, things based on PBS. We have a few education advocates who are also part of the group who post information, up-to-date information on homeschooling. CPS just rolled out um, this week the online remote um, program. So that information is posted in there. Um, and then just it's just a way for families to be able to and people in general mm -hmm. to connect with other people in the community and to be able to have up to date information and um, tips on what mm -hmm. they need to be doing at home. Yeah, and it's very reliable information. I can tell you, you know, personally, I have gotten information from this group that I would not get anywhere else. Even from oh, that's great. <laughs> officials. I mean, I found out about this town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I never would have found out. Yeah, and then we also want to make sure into this group. Sure, this we're keeping in tune with that, um, so we can. Post. Okay, Natasha, you're you're fading in and out. And did she? Okay, Natasha, can you hear us? Okay, so so Kay, do you want to <laughs> pick up until she comes back in? I think there's a connectivity issue. Okay, I mean, what were what was we? Because she was talking, I'm kind of. Okay, yeah, yeah. So so the question is, you know, I guess one of the things that I noticed is there was a town hall meeting, mm -hmm. you know, a virtual town hall meeting with the black elected officials at okay. the federal level, state level, right? Town, and the way I found out about it was through this group. Okay, she's back now. So, she's so are you you back with us? 
Okay, Natasha. Okay, yeah, she had to uh, reconnect. Okay. So, so what 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 we have done? We make sure we have our own personal connections. You know, people that we know mm -hmm. outside of the group um, mm -hmm. who do share information with us. So what we do, we make sure that that information, if it's pertinent information, anything community based isn't you know is important. We make sure we get it out there so that we can have the community involvement. You know, at those particular meetings. Other than that, mm -hmm. a lot a lot of people would have never heard about, you know, this town hall meeting was occurring, right? Yeah. Um, so that's just what we do. You know, we have Brian Mullins, who, you know, he's deeply into the politics, you know, political right. world. So he shares stuff all the time. We have other people in the group that shares with us about information, um, especially if it's automatic, like City mm -hmm. Hall just had a virtual meeting the other day. Um, quite a few of us attended that meeting. Um, so anything that we get, any type of event, we're getting these, it's a pool. We're getting it from, you know, our connections mm -hmm. outside of the group as well as inside of the group. And actually there's a lot of people in the group that are sharing this information. So they'll send it out and say, hey, there's a meeting I heard about or my organization, because there are people in there with their own organizations. She's back. Yes. So <laughs> see, you know, I was, with this podcast, I'm having issues with it. It keeps knocking me offline probably because of the snow and all of the people on it. Go ahead. So <laughs> I was I was pretty much Natasha. I was just sharing with her. She wants to know how do we go about the information that we get. And I was just telling her, you know, it's from our connections, the people that we know from other organizations. Mm -hmm. That's what community collab black community collaborative is. It's about having that connection with other organizations to to create a collaboration, right? So we can get mm -hmm. information and share so they we share their information they share our information so it's pretty much a network so that's how mm -hmm. we get a lot of the events you know and we post it in a group like you know if it's pertinent to COVID-19 um, or if it's something about resources we have two pages actually um, mm -hmm. so we have a, a page yeah that's black community collaborative you know the actual organizational page and then we have this pandemic page so we're putting information you know as it comes up, as it applies, uh, you know, to certain events, we put it out there. So we're pulling it. It's like a pool. We're pulling it from other organizations who are just people we know in general. Mm -hmm. So that's how we get the information. All right. So, Natasha, you are, I, I think you're a born organizer. You can't help it, right? It's in your blood. <laughs> it's in my blood. <laughs> it's in your blood. So what are some of the things you guys are doing? I, and I think Kate touched on some, you know, what are you doing to take some of this information off line, so to speak, and actually implement things in the real world? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're doing is we're actually collaborating with an, a group called Black Women um, Organizing for Power. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we've been meeting with them to create the needs assessment that you saw um, mm -hmm. that's posted on the page to be able to, you know, get real time information from people just to get their input and what's happening in their homes. Um, so we collect that data and be able to um, promote that and give that to our elected officials to create a need. Like what these are our needs and this is what we want from the community. I mean, from you as our representatives. The other thing is we're also working to um, advocate for more, well, they started opening up more testing sites. So that's some of the things that we're advocating for um, a little bit more. I mean, they're doing it slowly, um, but that's one thing. Also uh, creating a criteria where African-Americans are, are seen quicker, admitted into hospitals quicker if they need to, because what's been happening before is that they've been turned around um, to go home to self-isolate. And so we want to ensure that people who have these comorbidities, as Kay mentioned, that they're being seen immediately and that that data is being collected as well. Um, and then mm -hmm. also making sure that after the fact that there's um, information, there's streams of income, possibly even, um, you know, disability mm -hmm. income, things like that for our community to be able to have after this is over with, because, I mean, we know that this disease can actually cause long-term effects on your lungs. Um, and so we want to be sure that our community is not going to suffer economically um, as well. I mean, there's a few other things that we have on our list that we're working mm -hmm. on, trying to work with our um, you know, legislators to support it, um, but then mm -hmm. also to get the people involved in the property needs that's the aspect. Okay. All right. So you actually have an agenda that's in the works. Mm -hmm. that, that's I, awesome. There's someone mm -hmm. here that's saying that they can't hear us. Did you see, you see that? 
There's someone that commented and said that they can't hear us. Um, no, I, I need to scroll down. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna type in a response to Crystal. Crystal, yeah. And, yeah, this is Crystal Overton in mm -hmm. Congressman Davis's office. So while I'm typing, I'm gonna leave a question out there for one of you to pick up. How are housing advocates using this space? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you can answer that. Well, um, we do make sure that, well, we have been um, uh, giving out the resource information concerning like the, the rent, um, the thousand dollar rent grant or lottery that the mayor um, um, advocated and, and has spoke mm -hmm. up about. Um, mm -hmm. So with, with the housing, there are, we're putting that, we're putting the information out, but mm -hmm. we're still pretty much dealing with, um, I guess the logistics of things we mm -hmm. have to, because, you know, right now it's hard to meet. It's hard to get people to meet because, you know, mm -hmm. no one wants to come in contact with each other. Um, so we pretty much have to find another means like, you know, social media, like how we're doing meeting with you, where we can mm -hmm. actually meet with those groups to see what are their needs, where are their needs being met, you know, and what is it that we can do to assist with that? Right now, the only thing that we are able to do is we put the information out. So right. like I make sure that the information is posted at least once a day as it mm -hmm. comes up, as it as it changes, we put it out there. It's mm -hmm. from everything from uh, housing when mm -hmm. it comes to rent assistance. Um, mm -hmm. There's some information I have, but I'm working on because I want to fine tune it and make sure it's actually accurate. Mm -hmm. It's concerning the, the homeless community. And I'm trying to really see where the mayor, how she's going to pivot that and, and, you know, work that mm -hmm. in. So there, you know, there's more information that's going to be coming up on all fronts concerning all issues. But right now we're still working on those logistics of, you know, hooking up with all those organizations. You know, what I'm, yeah, what I'm hearing is this needs to be a two way street. Yes. You know, the, the information you're putting out there is extremely valuable. You know, mm -hmm. I always share it, you know, in my network, and I, you know, let folks know where I got it from. Mm -hmm. I think we as users need to let you know how we're using it so that you can then continue to advocate for more resources and help us, if that makes sense. That yes. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's something that we'll work on. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, alrighty, and yeah, I'll I'll be better about accounting. I, I can tell you how I use the information. You know, for okay. example, when I learned about that town hall meeting, I immediately put that in my newsletter, which went out to over a thousand people. I posted it on social media, and there were some people, you know, within the nonprofit Utopia Network who attended, and we would not have known about that but for the grace of God and you guys. And we were able to ask, you know, some pretty interesting questions. Now I'm hoping that the elected officials had someone to actually jot down answers. I mean, they had over a hundred, 104 questions that were asked yeah. and we need to hear a response. But we did get a question in our forum for you guys. Um, you know, Amandillo Kuzan, um, cousin, um, he says, thank you for organizing this forum. Credible information is really important right now. Can you please take a moment to share the best ways to wade through the more outlandish myths and misinformation about the pandemic? There are people already saying they will not be vaccinated even though one does not even exist yet because Bill Gates is going to plant a microchip. And that's just one of several ideas that are being pushed out with intensity. So if, if you have any strategies that we can use to, you know, sift through, you know, what's the so, so what I what I what I do in researching 
these topics. Um, it's not a a one stroke hitter, you know, on the on the key on the keyboard. Right. It can take hours, and you have to be dedicated to it, and you have to be very patient. And it's a lot of reading, a lot of reading, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the subject. So yeah. with the with the Bill Gates, the vaccination, the microchip, what he's talking about. Unfortunately, I have ran across a lot of propaganda, a lot of mis mis you know informed information concerning it. Um, I've yet to really find out what his true what his true intention or plan is. He has not yet really released it. You know, he throw tidbits out, but he's not really giving us full information. So it's kind of hard to deliver something when we don't have the the full you know info. Right. Because if I put it out now. And then he changes or fine tunes it opposite of what I put out. That's going to cause some confusion. And then we have to go back. And sometimes when you feed mm -hmm. people this information the first time, if they believe it, they hold on to it and it can be wrong. <laughs> They'll hold on to it. And it's kind of hard to, you know, try to guide them in a right. different, you know, direction from, you know, what the path that they're already taking. So with the vaccination, I am. I, there's a lot of stuff that I'm researching on this. Um, the vaccination is one. I want to make sure we're getting thorough information before I put it out there. Um, for me, it's kind of hard to talk about a vaccination when they're saying that they don't have one yet. You know, they don't even you know, they're still trying to get it together. They don't even know yet. They're still playing with it. So it's kind of hard to put that information out. Right. Because, you know, as a nurse, I know that. Um, you know, medical medical information changes a lot. It really does. And so when you put it out there, if I put it out there now, like they're saying a microchip, it might not be a microchip. It might be a basic vial, you know, like all the other vaccinations, right? A vial, you, you know, an injectable vial, you take the medication, that's it. If I put out a microchip, right, and people are really <laughs> believing us, when they come with this vial, then you're gonna have this this resistant, like, oh no. That's not what the black community collaborative told us. You know, we're not believing it. So we, you know, right now, and, and you, we have to be kind of delicate with the information that we put out. But um, I just ask everyone to just bear with us. As soon as I get the meat of what his plan is, I am more than willing to share it. I will share it. Um, but I, I just ask, I just would like to encourage people to right now research vaccinations, know the history of these vaccinations, know what has happened. Look up, le you know, legalities, look up what lawsuits have come up, what was discussed. Mm -hmm. Just research wow. those things right now. So when it comes out, you already have a sense of understanding. You know, it's, it's more than just getting a shot. You will have a sense of understanding if you do the research. Right. So when it comes out, a lot of stuff won't be a surprise to you. It's like, oh, I read that. I'm OK. You know, and <laughs> right, right, right. it should go across a little bit easier. That's the key is to be able, number one, like I said, we want to be sure that we're pro providing some valid information. So that does take research. That takes making sure that we're getting information from accurate sources. Um, but then also that we're communicating in, in a way where our community can understand it um, and that we're sort of dispelling any myths around it. Um, and that will include providing a history and a background. Why Exactly. Why, the reason why I believe, and I'm not a vaccination person. I don't believe in all vaccinations. Mm -hmm. My children, I for school, I do the waiver for vaccinations mm -hmm. because most of which I believe we're sort of immune to. So some, some of the vaccinations, I'm like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. But mm -hmm. I think for this particular case, I would get a vaccination just because this is a new virus. And I think if people understood that it's new, we don't know anything about it. We don't know what we're learning as we go along and that this is causing obviously ravage in our community. People are dying. You know, people are getting sick quicker. If you have hypertension, diabetes, which most black people have, you have a higher risk of getting it and or dying from it. So as a result of that, I think it's important for us to really understand the need for vaccinations and also look at the success of vaccinations. Now, the truth is there's going to be some trial and error just because it's new. The vaccination will be new. So we will probably mm -hmm. be walking placebos in it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we have to look at the bigger picture, knowing mm -hmm. that don't we want to get back to our regular way of life, right? Do we want to be able to get back out and talk to people face to face and be able to, mm -hmm. you know, be in large groups and gatherings? 
Um, and if that's the case, we will have to get vaccinated. You know, it's a possibility we would have to do that. So wait, I think we should start weighing out the good versus the bad um, and know that for the most part, I don't think that the world is out to get everybody. Um, yes, there will be some issues, but um, we just, we, we're going to research information to make sure that it's accurate and make sure that it's safe for our people um, and you know, work from that point. And, and, and also, like I said, and I would encourage everyone, if you have any type of comorbidity, if you have hypertension, asthma, asthma is one of the, 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 the um, Ill, ailments that some vaccinations work against it. But if you have these illnesses, I would encourage everyone to start researching and see what vaccinations that are already created that might affect, you know, the ailment that you already have, like get an understanding clearly of what's going on with you and your body. So when this stuff is presented to you, whatever questions you might fish around and have, then hopefully at that time, someone will be able to ask, you know, answer those questions on your behalf. But I think right now everyone should be encouraged to, um, you know, to start doing the research, especially for themselves, for your family. So you'll know what possibly you might be getting into when this vaccination comes along, you know, so, yeah. Okay, ladies, um, we're going to open it up for questions. But before we do that, I just want to let you know that Crystal indicated that she still can't hear us. She's going to call me and she'll okay. probably have something to say. And okay. um, I want to just check out these questions. But before we do, um, I want to ask Natasha, what are some of the lessons that you guys have learned along the way? Uh, the things change every day. Uh, and to just be flexible with that, with information. Um, and that this is going to be a long road. Um, it's not something that's going to be an overnight catch because we're actually seeing the disparities, the health disparities that's been going on for a long time that has not been addressed. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking for a long term plan. Um, that's the whole goal. Like this is a group. Yes, it's a Facebook group. But the goal is for us to be able to just start to the, the conversation about the needs in our community and to build forward so that we could, um, you know, have a long-term impact um, on what we need to be doing in our community to make sure that we're healthy, make sure that we're connected um, and that our issues are addressed. So just, you know, having the flexibility um, mm -hmm. and, and just being able to provide accurate information as it changes. Okay. All right. Did you have anything to add, Kay, before we go to these <laughs> questions? Um, one of the things that I've picked up the most on, I, I knew fear could be a powerful thing, but I had no idea that it had this much power. You know, fear is really driving a lot of the confusion, you know, that we're having, um, especially on Facebook, trying to understand and trying to share, you know, what we think this is and not us per se. When I say we, I mean, as you know, just as a nation, everyone that's in this country, you know, the things that we're sharing because we're afraid, you know, we're trying to come up with stuff and it, it it's not always right. right. It's just, you know, fear is we have to really be careful with fear. We, and we have to get out of those. Oh, it doesn't affect black people. Oh, it doesn't <laughs> affect the young people. Oh, it only affects people with illnesses. Um, I real quick, I lost a cousin last week to oh, no. the coronavirus. Her, her funeral service is actually going on as we speak. Um, she had no underlying ailments. She was healthy and the virus took her, you know, so it, it's 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 kind of it, you know you can't it has no respect of person and that's something that i that's the lesson that i'm getting out of it it has no respect of person it doesn't care about your age it doesn't care about your race it doesn't care if you have ailments or not it is taking people and it is not playing it is uh it's it's crazy you know so that's something that i'm learning that the coronavirus has no respect of person it's just it's taking bodies so that's just where you know that's where we are with this and then i also want to add to real quick what she's saying is is that i think the other key to take away is that this is a stressful time and 
we should acknowledge it, but also try to figure out ways where we can reduce the stress in our home because the stress is also going to be something that could contribute to us getting sick in another way, right? Mm -hmm. So figuring out ways that we could create spaces in our homes, uh, maybe within our communities with social distancing, um, where we could relax and be able to have some sort of peace and some sort of um, focus on on what's positive and what what's mm -hmm. not. Um, because if we keep constantly hearing all oh, the death, the death, the death, that definitely can cause us to have emotional issues. Yeah. yeah. Issues as well. Yeah. Okay. All righty. We got two questions in our forum. Okay. So the first question, and, and both of these questions are from Leighton Olson. And Leighton is an attorney as well as a consultant. And his big focus is on technology and bringing networks of community groups and institutions together. In fact, he's going to be on our show next Friday. Mm -hmm. And his first question is, please address the role of libraries in keeping the distribution of files. So what do libraries do to, to help us? In, okay, you know. so you kind of it kind of broke up. So um, I want to make sure I'm understanding. He wants to know um, how do how how can we address the roles of the library and how pretty much how could they be beneficial to us during this time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Well, I think the library, as it always have been, you know, it is a research palace. Um, one of the things I I did, Natasha's a witness to. Um, I have taken um, a um, a point of researching past pandemics. So I watch documentaries about um, influenza, like all the way back to the 20s to the 30s, you know, those past uh, pandemics. I, I look at how they handled it. They were doing sheltered, they was doing sheltered in even back then, right? Mm -hmm. And I think with the library, you know, you have books, you have publications that can give you that information on the past pandemics, how they, how did it come about? Um, how many people were affected? How many lives were taken? Um, what were the solutions, you know? And then, you know, for me, I like to align the past with where we are today. So for that, you can get past history of pandemics from the library, right? Um, you can use the library as far as uh, the computer systems, you know, uh, searching Google search, Bing, Safari. Um, but for the most part, I would say, Use use the library to understand the past instances of pandemics mm -hmm. and then try to, you know, draw your pull yourself to where we are today by going through, you know, those past instances. And I think you'll kind of understand pretty much why we're not being told everything at one time. <laughs> right. Um, why, you know, people are having a hard time believing something as little as shelter in can really be effective. This stuff has all happened in the past. So I will use a library to me in my, in, that, in my opinion, I would use a library for those instances to research the past pandemics so that you can understand the present pandemic, you know, where we are and why they're asking us to do stuff like sheltering in and et cetera. And I also add to that that I see them as a technology hub as well, providing their resources technically, but then yeah. also supporting our education system um, virtually as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they should be playing a very vital role in working collaboratively with CPS um, and making sure that our kids have the um, information they need virtually um, as well. Especially yeah. since the kids are doing e-learning and, you know, they're mm -hmm. at home. I think the libraries, they, they may be some type of technology hub where the kids can, um, you know, with my son, and I don't know how Natasha feel, my son is now 26. So when he was going to school, you know, technology was real big, the iPads, the G-pads. Mm -hmm. And so my son thought that he can only read a book that was on an electronic device. And I'm like, no, baby, pick up the, <laughs> pick up the actual book, you know, because there is a difference. There's some information left out of the actual book. You know, they, people take shortcuts sometimes with um, like, what is the book? The, the book thief, you know, he had to read that and he, he got it off. Um, he was off the device, but then I made him read the actual book and he like, 
Ma, it's like three chapters that they didn't talk about. And I'm like, see, you know, you have to, I, you know, I think that would be beneficial for the kids to give yeah. them those resources, you know, and, you know, not making learning. I hate to say lazy or easy, but let fish, fish for that education, fish for mm -hmm. that knowledge. And sometimes you have to open up the book, an uh, actual book to do that. So, you know, I think a library should, you know, be um, a, a great tool for our kids to use as well as the parents. Yes, the parents too. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess along those lines, I'm thinking maybe the library can actually facilitate, I guess, right now a virtual town hall, you know, since they have oh, yeah. the technology, they can host those meetings, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we get past COVID-19, hopefully they can continue to be like a town center or something to host you know other meetings um you know because they do have community rooms and all that good stuff they do they do um that's a good idea yeah let me see Layton had a second question would congressman davis sponsor the community dashboards for safety and mobility act in the next federal bill now i don't know if crystal is still on um, Crystal has left us, so that's a question for Crystal. You know, she wasn't able to hear, but I, I think that's a very good question. And Leighton, thank you so much. Thank you for that. All right, so it's 10.55. We got about five more minutes left, ladies. And my question to both of you is what's next? So what's next is um, we're going to continue collecting information. Um, we are going to start promoting this needs assessment um, so that we can make sure we're getting as much accurate information as possible from our people. Um, okay. And we're going to facilitate, we're going to do some, some town hall um, discussions as well and invite elected officials to them um, okay. to hear from the people. Uh, and yeah, we're going to, we're going to also, we're in the process of pushing the city of Chicago to create an African American um, advisory council. Because we mm -hmm. believe that this is the tipping mm. point. Um, I actually uh, wrote the city a while ago um, using data that suggests that we should have our own specific advisory council to work on issues in our community, but to be led by people in the community. Because one thing I know for sure is that we have a lot of experts in our community that's been doing this for a long time. And we know, and we live here. We're mm -hmm. black. <laughs> and, we live here. <laughs> and we and we know what we we know what we need to do. And I just think it's a, it's it's an opportunity to have a space for the office. And, and uh, work in collaboration with the city. So pushing further with that, um, I did have a meeting with Candace. Um, she's the yeah. chief equity officer. And while at the time she's open um, to it, they already had their set um, advisory councils that they wanted to promote. And I think a fifth one or a sixth one would have been too much for them. But I, I don't agree with that. I think that it's, it's not too much. It's it's what we need, especially considering now where we're at with this COVID-19. I think this is mm -hmm. the, the icing on the cake. So we're going to continue pushing for that mm -hmm. advisory council. Mm -hmm. oh, no, that's and that's oh, like, before you say that, that's so interesting. Natasha knows that I don't agree with Rahm Emanuel on most everything. Probably 98% <laughs> of the stuff we disagree on. But one thing I do agree never let a crisis go to waste right yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah use this opportunity right to, to mm -hmm. promote something we're gonna use your numbers we, we we're gonna use your zip codes to your numbers that we know where they all are in our community so come on now <laughs> <laughs> right right so um one of the things that well two of the things that i was already currently working on before this pandemic which is now even a greater need um, as far as employment resources, um, not going to give too much. We are working, the Black Community Collaborative, we are working on um, a resource, an employment resource oh, that would help provide employment, especially now, you know, people are losing their jobs uh, due to this mm -hmm. pandemic. Uh, businesses, some businesses very well might go out of business, you know, so we're going right. to have more unemployment is up is sky's the limit now so right now um one of the things that i'm working on is um employment resources 
um, having that information out so that people can go out and obtain those jobs. You know, um, also I have I've have a connection with a couple of community centers who do um, <clears throat> like um, interview courses, entrepreneurship courses. Um, one of the things that I, I want uh, Black Community Collaborative to do is to help um, close the opportunity of divide um, because that's something that's really needed. You know, if you go to the job, be able to land that job, you know, and get that job. Um, also, another thing that I was currently working with um, in conjunction with Patrick Brutus and um, I think her name is Kate. I was already involved with the Invest Southwest um, initiative that was already underway here in um, Auburn Gresham, South Shore. So we're still gonna, you know, keep our eye on that. Yeah, keep our eye on that and make sure that that money that was set aside is being used for things that we truly need to build up our community besides the flower pots, you know, some real, right, right some real, you know, things that are gonna really help benefit our community. So I am still involved with that as well. So that is, um, a couple, and then I have another project with the felon community. Um, there are some things that I want to do as far as um, aiding uh, the felon community mm -hmm. as well as the homeless community. So there's a lot of things that we're working on um, in the future. Yeah, That's awesome. You know what? I need to share with you, you know, since you mentioned Patrick Brutus and Invest <laughs> West, um, mm -hmm. if you guys remember, you know, they did on the table discussions last mm -hmm. year. They normally do this every year, but they decided mm -hmm. not to because of the pandemic. Right. Um, I was in a group with Patrick Brutus and some other African Americans on the South Side, mm -hmm. um, looking at, I believe, six communities. And I'm just speaking off the top of my head um, six communities, including Auburn Gresham, South Shore, Grand Crossing. And new city, other. new city is one as well. Yeah. Uh, well, back of the yards, new city. Um, um, uh, is it? I think a part of. I want to say a, there was like a segment of Ashburn, but don't quote me on it. Because um, mm -hmm. there was a total of ten, and and there's a total of ten communities mm -hmm. that the funding is going towards. But um, I believe the media that you talking. There was a. There was about six, but yeah, it was. Um, mm -hmm. South Shore, Auburn, Gresham. I even think Ingle, Inglewood was there too, if I'm Inglewood not mistaken. One, yeah. yeah, Inglewood was one too. Yeah. So what I'll do, I'll I'll share with you our memo to the mayor. You know, okay. since it sounds like some of those people in your group who are working on this, and Patrick was one of them. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't mind. Um, so they had a pretty comprehensive set of um, alternatives and recommendations that they share it with the mayor. We never heard back. But this information, I think, is so rich. It's sitting there on my hard drive. Somebody, <laughs> you know, somebody needs to use it, right? Right. So I will share this, you know, in, in the form, and you guys have at it, you know? Okay, thank you so much. All righty. So it's 11.02. And yes, and I have another conference to do after <laughs> this. But I thank you for having us. And thank you. Going. We'll keep communicating and keep, keep sharing information to empower our people. Yes. All right. And, and thank you guys for inviting me. I mean, I've learned so much. All I have to do is, you know, go to the group and I can answer almost any question that was on my mind just from looking at the stream in the group. That's good. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Good to know. <laughs> All right. And before we go, how can people contact you? And, and well, before that, how can people try this at home? You know, there may be other people who may not necessarily be focusing on the same issue, but the process might be similar. You know what I mean? There may be other community groups who might want to, if they don't want to organize around COVID-19, they may want to use social media to organize around something else. So as you give your parting thoughts, you know, just give some thought to how people can try this at home and how they can contact you. All right. So I'll leave that for both of you and then we'll go. Okay, I'll start. Um, the first thing is that we can be contacted via Facebook. Um, we have a Facebook page, Black the Black Community Collaborative. Um, and then we also have a Gmail account, um, Black Community Collaborative um, at gmail.com. 
Um, I think the way people can definitely, you can always reach out to us. We're there and willing to assist and work with people um, and groups to help collaborate with them on a way that is best suited for them. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing is identifying what your needs are first and, um, and then we can sort of help navigate around what that is. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so providing some assistance and consulting. Yeah. So, and, and my contact is the same. You can get, you can reach either one of us through uh, what she had already stated, our website. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Facebook page, the Gmail account. Yeah, that's okay. it. Or through the, or through the pandemic group. You can always message us through yeah. there as well, mm-hmm. through the Black Community Collaborative um, pandemic group. You can get us through there as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then ideally, now, do you have to have any background do they have to be invited to join the group or can they ask to join they can ask um but how it happened originally when we did it we just blasted a lot of invites based off our pages and then we left it open for those people because i pretty much i wrote an initial post saying you know invite 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 so you know people can invite out the group or they can search out the group and they can just ask to be you know invited in it works either way yeah Mm -hmm. it works either way Mm -hmm. that's good all right (laughs) thank you so much and we'll be in touch all right thank you all right bye 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 bye